carrying his own cross, he went up to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him. One of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. years and uh, I was just thinking you know how how this story never changes and it's a challenge to try to bring a new truth or something fresh to you about the old story but what about that story do we want to change right it's, it's, it, you can't get any better so you know we're just going to talk about this today we're going to talk about the empty promises of the cross and the empty promises of the tomb and the empty promises of the empty grave clothes today. Talking about empty promises, though, uh, how many of you, how long has it been since maybe you had an empty promise? Someone gave you an empty, empty promise or, or you received an empty promise? It, it probably hasn't been very long, and here's why. It's because it's, it's the political season, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we're being bombarded with promises. You know, I Googled empty promises in my computer. I just Googled it just to see what would come up. And you know, the number one thing that comes up when you Google empty promises is empty political promises. They, they tell you everything. They're going to fix the economy, man. They're going to not raise taxes. In fact, they might lower them. They're going to fix the borders. They're going to fix all of our health care programs. They're going to fix everything. And as we know, most of those are empty promises. We give empty promises. Maybe at work you've been given empty promises. You know, you're in your occupation. What you do there is, is you go and they'll promise you everything. They'll promise you more money or better benefits or, or days off. But a lot of times those things are empty promises. We have empty promises in relationships so many times. In relationships we have promises where, well, let's say, for example, a parent has empty promises, gives empty promises to their child, you know, just to get the kid off their back. And then the, the promise isn't kept. Or sometimes, you know, a kid will give empty promises to the parents. For example, I'll be home at 11. And, uh, <laughs> or I'm not going to go there, you know. And then you find out that it's kind of an empty promise. Um, how about marriage? In marriage, there's a lot of empty promises with a divorce rate running about 50%. We promise to love, honor, cherish, obey. We promise to... Be faithful. And uh, a lot of times, those promises are empty. We're filled with empty promises. Uh, people have given you empty promises at work, empty promises in relationships, empty promises on the political arena. But what about, uh, what about you? Uh, have you given people empty promises? Um, how about God? Have you ever given God an empty promise? Ah. Uh, uh, Lord, you get me out of this mess, and I promise you I'll pray. I'll pray more. I'll pray every day. And he gets you out of the mess, and, and you find that you're too busy to pray. You're too busy at work, or you're too busy chaperoning or, or chauffeur, uh, sh 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 running the kids around. <laughs> you're, 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 you're busy busy watching television. Are you just busy doing nothing, but you're too busy to pray? Or maybe, maybe you, you promise the Lord, Lord, I'm going to be more patient <laughs> with these crazy people that are in my life. I, I, I am. I'm, I'm going to be patient. But then you find pretty soon that you're yelling at one of them <laughs> harder and worse than, than you've ever yelled before. You see, the, we are filled. We're surrounded by empty promises. And it's become kind of a way of life. We accept it from people. We accept ourselves. We, 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 we do it. And we know that. And I was thinking about that in, in connection with the disciples at, 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 at the cross that day when Jesus died. And they watched him die. Now, what did they think about the promises that had been given them and made to them? Uh, do you think they maybe thought that maybe Jesus had just given and offered some empty promises? Well, here's the truth. Uh, you see... Jesus never offers empty promises. In fact, Jesus will come back from the dead to fulfill 
his promises that he makes to us. In fact, what Jesus does is he finds our emptiness and he fills it with promises. Is that right? And so in this lesson today, what I want to talk about is looking at these, at these promises of fulfillment in our lives that we look at as we look at the empty cross and the empty tomb and the empty grave clothes. Watch this. John chapter 19, verse 17 and 18, and then down in verse 34, says this. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him. And verse 34 says, Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. What is the promise of the empty cross? Well, first, let me explain a little about sacrifices. See, man is imperfect. Man curses, cheats, lies, and steals. Man deceives, gossips, grumbles, gripes, judges, discriminates. Man hates, he assaults, he fights, he wars, and he kills. Man is selfish, he's hoarding, he's indulgent, he's extravagant, he's wasteful and polluting. Man is lustful, he's immoral. Man will take what he wants, not caring who it hurts. Man will seek pleasure to satisfy his lust, even if it destroys those he loves. Even when man deals with God, he neglects, he ignores God, he denies God, he rejects, and he even curses God. These things are all obviously wrong, which means they are sinful and evil. Now, that's in anyone's book, not only in the Bible. Built into each of us is a knowing hell awaits if something is not done about one's wrong, sinful, and evil ways. Now, we attempt to convince ourselves there is no hell, but we cannot ever completely believe there is no hell. Actually, God will not allow you to totally believe there is no hell. What was done to correct that horrible situation of separation between man and God? Though man in and of his own is vile, God loves man. Why? Because God created man. Now you can relate to that if you have a child. No matter how vile your child ever becomes, you love that child. As you would do all you could to help your vile child turn around, God does everything he can to help man turn around. In the Old Covenant, God provided a substitute system to take the judgment and punishment for man's sin and evilness. An animal could be sacrificed and die instead of the man being judged for his sin and evilness. The animal had to be flawless, which represented sinlessness. Once the sacrifice was offered, man's wrong, his sin and evil ways were covered by that death of that animal. Man could then, because of the covering of sin, fellowship with God and avoid hell. Thousands, millions, maybe billions of animals died for that reason, which testifies of man's deep inner desire to do what is right and to have a relationship with God. However, there were many problems with that old covenant system. An animal was only an animal, not a man. A true replacement for a man could only be a man, not an animal. Another problem was the sacrifice, though flawless, was not perfect. So the sacrifice had to be repeated over and over and over again. Still another problem existed. Animals were not perfect in that animals eventually die. See, the perfect sacrifice must be eternal if the sacrifice eternally dealt with sin. Another problem was animals were actually victims, not willing substitutes. The perfect sacrifice must willingly die for man's vileness. Now, what was the solution? The solution was for an eternal sacrifice to die meant God had to die, for only God is eternal. For that to happen, God had to become and live as a man tempted with all the temptations and evils a man faces, yet live a sinless life. Then that sinless man had to willingly die for sinful, evil, and even vile people. Now this is the reason Jesus went to the cross for you and for me. 
In each of us, every single one of us, there is an emptiness, a voidness. We're born with it. And, and whether anybody ever tells you about God or not, anybody ever explains the things of God to you or not, you have this emptiness and this voidness within you, and you will spend time searching for the truth about God. It's, it's, it's in, in us. We're built this way. It, we're made this way. From this particular principle is where all the world's religions come. And all the spiritism comes. People trying to find God and searching for God. But the only way, and we know now, the only way that you can come to God is no longer through animal sacrifices or any system like that. The only way you can come to God is through Jesus Christ. That's why he came. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way. He is the door. And there is no other way. And so we got to understand this. So Jesus came to be a perfect sacrifice for us. The only eternal sacrifice that will eternally deal with your sins. You don't have to do it every year. You don't have to offer an, a sacrifice. Jesus eternally dealt with it. Now, in the book of Hebrews, we see something that's extremely interesting to me. We're shown there a recording of a conversation between Christ and Father God. And I want to read you just an excerpt from that particular passage. It's in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 8. Reading here, Christ said, here he's speaking to Father God, Christ said, you did not want animal sacrifices or grain offerings or animals burned on the altar or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them. Was God pleased with that animal stuff? No. He was not pleased with that. He was doing it just so that man can get back to him. See? But now watch this. Though they are required by the law of Moses, then he added, Christ added to the Father, Look, I I've come to do your will. I want to make you happy. I want to do it your way. I want to do it the way it pleases you. And he goes on and he says, now watch this. He cancels the first covenant in order to establish the second there will never be, hear me, never be animal sacrifices again. I don't care what you hear, the Bible says he's canceled that. In order that he can establish a brand new covenant or a brand new way for us to come to God. So when a person comes to God by faith in Christ, that perfect sacrifice is applied to that life. And that perfect sacrifice of Jesus deals eternally with your sins. This is what the cross has done for us. This is the promise of the cross. It eternally deals with our sins, which is called forgiveness. Forgiveness. God won't bring it up again. It's done. It's called forgiveness. The person is not sinless. Now hear me. When you come to Christ, you're not sinless. In fact, you'll go the rest of your life and not be sinless. But you are received as sinless because of the cross. Do you understand? See, we're not sinless. I'm going to read you a scripture in a second that says, if you say you are, then you're a liar. Nobody is sinless. But we can come to God because of the cross for what Jesus did. This is the promise of it. But it goes beyond that. Not only are we forgiven of our sins, but now we can interact with God. We can talk with God. We can, we can become a part of God's program and have fellowship with him. But also something that's so important, that voidness, that emptiness inside of your soul, that you hunger and you thirst and you want to know God is filled. But this is the only way this will all happen. Let me, let me show you this. It's in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. It says, but if we walk, if we live, if we have a relationship with God and the Holy Spirit and with Jesus Christ, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Now, this one another thing here is not horizontal fellowship. Contextually, that's not what it's talking about here. It's Vertical fellowship, one with another, me with God, God with me. This is the fellowship that the context is speaking of here. This is the only way this happens. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus. His son does what? Purifies. Now that's a big word. I think we think cleanse just kind of cover it up. No, no, no. 
It's purified. It is totally cleansed. The King James Version says cleanseth, but the word means you're totally clean. Every vile, wicked, wrong, evil thing that you ever did is totally cleansed from you. Now you can approach God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's cleansed. It purifies us from all sin. How many? Oh, no, not all. Can't be all, right? God's going to remember one, right? How many? All sin. Anything you've ever done is taken away, out of the way, so that you can have complete access to God. All sin. If we claim to be without sin, we, de well, we, what? we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, I have never met anybody that said they had not si that sinned. I've, I've never had. <laughs> We've all sinned. We all have this, and we all need this blood of Jesus Christ, this cross, this promise of the cross. See, that purify thing, I want you to get that. God's not going to bring it up. It's taken away. It, you sin, you, you will always be sinful, but as you approach God because of the, of the cross of Christ, you can interact with God. You can pray to God. You can come before God as though you had never sinned because Jesus never sinned. <clears throat> now, the promise of the cross is this, is that your sins are purified from you, washed away. You are forgiven. You now can have interaction with God. And this emptiness and this voidness, your hunger for God is now filled. Now, before I move on, I want to ask you a question. Those of you who, who have experienced this, those of you who have experienced a relationship with, with, with God, with Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, those of you who looked and longed for God and that the only way that you were ever filled and had this voidness inside of you ever filled, if, if I've told the truth, if this is how it really, really works, would, would you raise your hand and say, yes, that's exactly how it works. That's it. That's it. Nothing fills you like that. So I want to move on. I want to talk about now the, the promise of the empty tomb. What is the promise of the empty tomb? How does it fill us? Well, we, we heard the scripture read just a second ago, but I want to read it to you again. It's in John chapter 19, verse 41. It says, at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now, what's so special about that tomb? I mean, isn't a tomb just a place that represents where something died? I mean, I mean when you think about it, now just think about it, isn't the whole globe just a big graveyard? A huge cemetery? I mean, and you're looking at me like, Delbert, that doesn't sound like you. I, I know it, I'm making a point. But is that not true? Every living thing dies. Trees last hundreds of years, grow to hundreds of feet, but one day they die. Animals die. Each of us have had pets. The pet died. Animals die. Fish die. Birds die. Reptiles die. Everything, every living thing dies. Plants die. Everything. People die. People die. Now, Within a hundred years, within one century, most of us will die. Wow. <laughs> Every living thing dies. The Bible calls this the wages of sin. Because of Adam and Eve's mess up, this set in motion, this wages of sin. Now, because of that, everything dies. Now, back to my point. Back to my point. And unless you're without sin, you will die. Now, back to the point. What is so special about that tomb? Is it because it was so architecturally structured, so beautiful? No. Is it because of the remains of the person who died there or was placed there? No, because there's no remains there. So what is so special about that empty tomb? The only thing that makes that empty tomb special is that it's empty. Right? Who would care if it wasn't empty? That empty tomb is special because that empty tomb is empty. <laughs> now, now, you know, I was thinking about that on the first Easter Sunday. The first Easter Sunday. Uh, didn't a whole lot of people care about that empty tomb. Uh, maybe 11 disciples, a few of the followers with Christ, a few upset Pharisees. They cared. <laughs> but other than that, you know, 
Nobody really cared. But now here it is nearly 2,000 years later. And you know what? Half of the globe's population cares. Three million people are now Christ followers. And what's so wonderful about today is today, along with you and me, three million other people are doing exactly what we're doing. They're rejoicing because that tomb is empty. You say, yeah, yeah. That's what this is. See, and what makes it special is that it's empty. Now, how can that, what brought that about? What, what caused that to happen? Why from, you know, maybe 500 people to 3 billion people? What happened? I want to read you a quote from a book. It's from, from uh, a guy named Max Lucado, and he wrote a book, and his, the book is titled, He Chose the Nails. Read this to you. Jesus was a backwater peasant. He never wrote a book, he never held an office, he never journeyed more than 200 miles from his hometown. Friends left him, one betrayed him, those he helped forgot him. Prior to his death, they abandoned him. But after his death, they couldn't resist him. What made the difference? And the answer is, the empty tomb. That made the difference in billions of lives. That made the difference in this world. This world has never been the same since that tomb was found empty. (laughs) What's the promise of the empty tomb? When Jesus rose from the dead, it showed that God's plan of eternal salvation, here I'm here saying it, not only salvation in old covenant ways, but eternal salvation worked. The plan of eternal salvation is more than our only being forgiven of our sins or more than our only having a relationship with God. The plan of eternal salvation includes something far greater. You see, those who grab the promise of the empty tomb will share in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They too will be raised from the dead. Let me read you this. It's in Romans chapter 6 and verse 5. If we have been united with him like this in his death, speaking here of water baptism as the context, we will certainly be united with him in his resurrection. What does that mean? Well, one of the main things that it means is not that I will only be raised from the, from the ground, from the grave in the resurrection, but it means that I don't fear death. So many people fear death. Now, now hear me right, I don't want to die. I'm not looking for my ticket. I'm not planning on going anywhere, but I know one day I'll die. And you can live a life that's fearful of that. Or you can grab this promise of the empty tomb and know that my thing, my existence does not end with a decayed body in the ground. That's not how it ends for me. And not how it ends for anybody who's grabbed the truth of that empty tomb. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55, it says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. How we thank God who gives us victory over sin, and not only sin, but what? Death. Death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I want you to look deep. Look inside of you. Do you fear death? Are you frightened by it? If you, ha- if you do, then you've not yet grasped this truth. Don't fear death. It can't sting you. My body does not end decayed in the ground. My body's coming out of the ground because of the promise of the empty tomb. How about you? Is that good? That's all right, right? So the promise of the cross, promise of the empty cross is this, is that we're forgiven of our sins and that we have now a a way to God. We're received as sinless, even though we're not sinless, but yet we're received as sinless and we can fellowship with God, talk to God, have God involved in our lives and be a part of his plan. And the the emptiness inside of us is, is filled by the love of God. And then also the promise of the empty tomb is this, is that there's a promise that it doesn't end in this life. It's an eternal salvation. Way better than what a goat could do for you. Jesus Christ did this for you. So, one more promise that I want to talk about, and it's the promise of the empty grave clothes. I want to read you this passage. It's in John chapter 19, verse 40, and then I want to read also in John chapter 20. It says, taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it. Now, I need you to say wrapped it back to me. Say it, wrapped it. One more time. Wrapped it, because this is so important. 
they wrapped it. They wrapped it with the spices in the strips of linen. In what? The strips of linen. Not a shroud, not a big sheet. Didn't roll him up in a big old sheet. Strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. You remember the story about Lazarus? How Lazarus came out of the tomb and he was all wrapped up? And Jesus said, loose him, let him, let him go. This is the custom. They would wrap them in, in the long linen sheets, strips. And in John chapter 20, verse 5, it says this. He stooped. This he is speaking of John the Apostle as he and Peter went to the tomb that day. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen cloth lying there. But he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed, watch this, the linen wrappings lying there, lying right where they were supposed to be, lying there. <laughs> he also noticed the linen, linen wrappings lying there while the cloth that, was cover, that, that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and laying to the side. Now, get that picture. The linen wrappings were laying where they were supposed to be, but the head covering was folded nice and neat and laying separate, laying where it wasn't supposed to be. <laughs> then the other disciple also went in, and he saw and what? Believed. Believed. Now, right there, it tells you the, what this does for you, the promise. You can get this. You can believe. This is, this is, this is, this is what this will do for you. Get this, you believe. See, Judy and I, we watch CSI. CSI stands for Crime Scene Investigation. Uh, we watch all of them. We watch CSI. We watch CSI Miami. We watch CSI New York. And, and what they do is they go to these scenes, these crime scenes, and they get, they get forensic evidence to make proof of what happened here at this scene. So I was thinking about that. You know, now what would CSI find here at this scene? that we're being described. What would they find? What, what would they come up with? What would their conclusions, what would the proof they would come up with mean? What would it be? So I was thinking about that. So let's look at the evidence. Let me give it to you. What happened is, is according to the custom, they washed the body of Christ as he come off of the cross. Now we get kind of told they hurriedly wrapped him all up. No, 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 it was as the custom was. And they would wash the body. They didn't wrap him up all bloody and stuff. They, they washed him. And then they took these linen strips not big sheet, linen strips, and they started at his neck, and they began to wrap him round and round, around each arm, each hand, around his waist, around each leg, each foot. Then they took another cloth, a separate cloth, and put it over his face. His face and head wasn't wrapped. It had a cloth over it. Then they would lay him in the tomb. Now, inside of these wrappings was like 75 pounds of spices, and the purpose for that is to try to deter the smell, the stench of decaying flesh. That's what it was there for. Inside of the wrappings was, was this spice placed. They laid him in the tomb. They went out. A big stone was placed at the entrance of the tomb, and also placed at the entrance of the tomb were trained guards, warned, that somebody was going to come and try to steal the body. That's what they were there for. They were warned, and they were trained, and they were prepared for that event to take place, if it took place. Now, they left. Next morning, you remember the story. As they get to the tomb, as John and Peter get there, the stone has been moved. The guards are gone. John runs up. He looks in. And what he sees stops him in his tracks, and he just goes to his knees. He stoops down. He sees those linen wrappings laying there where they're supposed to be, but like an empty cocoon. They're just there, just laying there. Peter doesn't stop. He just runs right in. And then the Bible says that he too saw those linen wrappings just laying there, laying where they were supposed to be, but just laying there. But off to the side, the head wrapping was over here, all folded up, nice and neat, and laying over here, over here to the side. And that's what they saw. And that's what CSI would come and what CSI would see. This linen cocoon and this other thing laying over here to the side. So what would they think? Now, remember that the Jews said that the body was stolen. Remember? Now, 
I, I don't know if you, I hope not. I don't know if you've ever experienced a robbery. <laughs> uh, Judy and I have amazingly experienced two robberies in, in, in our married life. And both of them were after we came home from church. We, we were robbed while we are in church. We go home, and let me tell you something. I assure you, robbers do not fold and lay anything neatly. Uh, they are nothing where it's supposed to be. Every, the door's kicked in, windows are broken, every closet's open, all the shelves are dumped into the floor, everything's all over the floor, every drawer is pulled out and dumped, every little box, things under your bed that you don't want anybody to see are pulled out there, and just every place, everything is a total mess. That's not what was happening here at this scene. What happened at this scene is things were where they were supposed to be. The only thing missing was a body. And so CSI would come in and they would look. What's going on? All the forensic evidence just says, wow. Hey, you know what? It couldn't have been stolen. You know, I was thinking about that. You know, the guards are there. Now, they've been told, be careful. <laughs> they might try to steal this guy. You know, be careful. So they're prepared. They're armed. They're ready. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. So, so all the evidence is laying there. I mean, why would anybody uh, unwrap the body to steal it and then rewrap it like a cocoon? And why would they take time to fold it over and then lay it over here all by itself in a special place? What CSI would come up with is all the proof, all the forensic proof, says that something miraculous happened. Jesus Christ is who he says he is. And he arose from the dead. God raised him from the dead. There is no other explanation. There is no other explanation. The book of John chapter 20 verse 8, the end of that that we read, I want to read it to you one more time. Then the other disciples, speaking here of John, also went in, and he saw, and what? He believed. The empty grave clothes forever changed John's life, Peter's life, and all the other disciples' life. So much so that before they would renounce Christ and say that this wasn't true, they would die. John, who wrote this, is said to have been boiled alive, but didn't die. And then he was exiled. We know this happened. Exiled to an isle of Patmos, an isle called Patmos, and he remained there for the rest of his life. But he would never renounce Christ. Peter was crucified upside down. He says, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. I'm not renouncing him, so just crucify me upside down. Every disciple, before they would renounce Christ, died. The truth and the promise of the empty, to, empty grave clothes is belief. Positive. Forensic positive truth that Jesus rose from the dead and that he is exactly who he says he is. There is no other explanation. None. You cannot explain it any other way. Jesus Christ arose from the dead. And what that will do for you and for me, once you grab the promise of that empty grave clothes, you believe that way. Before you will ever renounce or deny Jesus Christ, you'll die. That's the promise of the empty grave clothes. Believe. It couldn't have happened any other way. The empty cross promises forgiveness, even purification from your sins as though they didn't happen. And though a sinner, you can yet commune with God because of the promise of the cross. That empty cross forgives you of your sins, connects you back with God, and begins to fill that empty void in you in your search for God. The promise of the empty tomb promises you life after this life, a resurrected life, a life where your body won't be there in decay forever. You will be raised again with Three million that are alive now and no untold, uh, three billion that are alive now and untold billions that came before us. That's the promise. And the promise of the, of the empty grave clothes is this, is that when you grab it, 
Nothing will ever change or shake your faith. It doesn't matter what anybody says or what anybody does. You know Jesus Christ rose from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of God in heaven. He is Lord of lords and King of kings. Those are the promises. With these promises, we're filled. See, through Jesus' empty cross and empty tomb and empty grave clothes, God will fill your emptiness with promise. In fact, there is no other way for that emptiness to be filled. This and this alone will satisfy the hunger you have and the emptiness you have and the desire you have to not only do right, but also have a connection with God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a wonderful, wonderful season of the year. Easter. Resurrection Day. Thank you, Lord, that we're able to come together with billions of people all around this globe doing what we're doing, making a declaration, announcing that Jesus Christ has risen indeed. Father, I thank you for this. Heads bowed and eyes closed. First thing, I was meditating and I wanted to, to, to just pray for people. And as I, as I got to that place where, where, you know, where we fear death, I really felt to bring that just a little bit strong because I, I just know some of you fear death. You haven't yet grasped that truth of, of, of the empty tomb. Don't fear death. I want to pray for you. If, if that's you and, and you struggle here sometimes and, and sort of you just have this death fear, I, I just want to pray with you right now and ask the Lord to assure you, assure you, give you peace that there is eternal salvation and not just salvation while you live, but there is no fear of death. If that's you, would you raise your hand and just let me pray for you right where you are? I see hands, hands every place. Yes, I see hands. Well, Father, thank you. Thank you for that. Father, I ask you now in Jesus' name that you'll touch each one of these people. Father, uh, let them grasp the truth of that. Death has no sting. The grave has no victory. So, Father, I pray now you'll bring them peace, peace in the name of Jesus Christ. One more thing and then we'll dismiss. Maybe you have never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you once did, but now you've allowed over years, you haven't been confessing those sins, you haven't had communion with God, and those things have piled up and sort of interrupted your connection with Him. Listen, He wants to fix that right now. He loves you so much. He wants to connect back with you. And so what the Lord wants to do right now is totally, once again, purify you from that stuff so that he can connect back to your life, fill your voidness, and fill your life with joy. If that's you, maybe, maybe you've gotten away from God or maybe you've just never received him. Now is what a wonderful time to do that. I'm just going to ask you just in a minute to raise your hand and let me pray for you right where you're sitting. The relationship you have with God is personal. The relationship you have with Jesus Christ is personal. The relationship you have with the Holy Spirit is personal. But there is a thing that says that if we don't confess him before God, he can't confess us before his angels. So I ask you right now, if that's you, you've gotten away from the Lord, or maybe today is going to be your day to be purified from your sin and all the vile things that you've done in life, and for God to move in your life and begin to fill your life with a fullness that you've not yet experienced, I want you just to raise your hand right where you're sitting and let me pray for you. I see hands over here. Two, three. Any others? Four, five, six. Any others? One more. Come on. Seven. Praise God. Praise God. Eight. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Nine. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Welcome, all of you. Welcome just back into the kingdom of God or welcome into the kingdom of God. That is so beautiful. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I want to pray for you. I want everybody in here to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, wash me from my sins. Purify me. Come into my heart. Let's have relationship. I ask you to do it this Easter day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you give the Lord a big celebration? Hallelujah. Let's all stand together.